Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to our uh, French Panorama panel. The first 100% French panel in <laughs> Perugia. Uh, last year, uh, Chris Potter and I thought it would be interesting to bring a, a French perspective on uh, the media landscape in France. And so we organized this panel. And then between then and now happened, as you may know, a major crisis in France, the Gilets Jaunes, Yellow Vest. And we thought... Uh, the, it's a crisis that has been addressing and uh, interrogating uh, the media, the newsroom. We thought we would uh, try to uh, explain you uh, our perspective on this. So let me let me greet uh, my guest, uh, Sylvie Kaufman, who is uh, ed uh, editorial director yeah. of Le Monde, newspaper of record. Uh, she has been editor-in-chief of the newspaper. She's also a contributing writer, columnist with the New York Times. She's also on the advers advisory board of the Reuters Institute in Oxford. Uh, next to me, Pierre Louette, CEO of Le, Les Echos Le Parisien, a media group which, which ha who has two uh, dailies, the business daily and a... Um, a national daily of general news is going to tell you about that. And here is Pascal Rufnac, who is CEO of Group Bayard, uh, who uh, okay. has a daily news called La Croix, one of the oldest in France, and who has a very interesting business model uh, that is going to explain you. And then we will uh, talk about the Gilets Jaunes. <laughs> so, Pierre, you start. One second. Okay, thank you, Florence. So how am I going to do this? So I'm going to do it with the hands and without pictures. It's going to be... Um, no, it's, it's online now. Okay, so just a few words about, about the group. I think it's... Um, uh, you know, we have to spend a little time, not too long on this one, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a French media group which uh, basically is organized around two newspapers with a very different perspective on the news. Uh, the first one, Les, Les Echos, is uh, the economic and business community newspaper. It was uh, launched more than 110 years ago, so it's a very old uh, newspaper. Um, it has a, a reach that, that grows year after year uh, because it's become also more generalist in the sense it talks about politics, culture, and uh, different uh, areas also of interest. Uh, the group overall has uh, this, the turnover that you can see on the screen. We have uh, 700 journalists uh, working on the group, um, and um, it's the largest uh, in terms of circulation uh, national newspapers group in France today. And the other newspaper, Le Parisien, was launched after the Second World War, and uh, it has a very broad coverage of news. It's like a generalist uh, approach of news, and it gives information about everything uh, you can think of uh, to, to the French population. It is pretty much uh, focusing on Paris and its um, large uh, area, but it's also uh, called Aujourd'hui en France, Le Parisien Aujourd'hui en France. Uh, it's the, the red one, and this is a national newspaper. Um, just also to, to let you know for full disclosure that this uh, media group belongs to another group, which is a bit uh, bigger, actually. And we happen not to be the most profitable division of the LVMH group, uh, which I think all of you might have uh, understood uh, uh, instantly. But we're a jewel, in a way, um, like Bulgari or others. We are kind of a jewel when it comes to media. So the group is very, very powerful, and uh, it has a, a media division. has had it for about 20 years, so it's kind of a tradition... Uh, for them. Uh, Les Echos, I mentioned, um, has a core target, which is the executives and business community. Uh, we're very happy to see that our online circulation grows and grows. We now have more um, digital subscriptions than paper subscriptions. Obviously, we all uh, suffer from the same uh, difficulties when it comes to uh, people buying uh, papers uh, in a paper version. This is rapidly decreasing. Last year, most of our newspapers around the table here, if I may speak for my colleagues, uh, we lost between 16 to 18% of sales in the kiosk. You know, so if you do that uh, year after year, 
I'm not a super mathematician, but it leads to close to zero in, in about 15 years or something like that. So, so we, we need to absolutely defend the paper to some extent because it's a statutory thing and it's also important for some people to have access to the paper, but also uh, develop the uh, uh, digital versions. And so Les Echos has done this uh, transformation now. And Le Parisien has, uh, it's a bit of more difficult for Le Parisien because they come from a very, very large audience uh, basis. It's for the general public, uh, around 300,000 copies per, per day, so which is a, a large uh, circulation, 60% around Paris and 40% uh, national. We have a, a huge um, uh, audience uh, coming to the websites and the applications, but it's more difficult now to turn them into subscribers. So we're working on this very heavily. And as you can see on the screen also, we have been um, focusing over the last uh, month um, a lot about all the matters uh, that matter to the, to the general audience, which are the price of gasoline, the price of uh, um, real estate, and, and uh, actually a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, there was a headlines um, in Le Parisien saying, Macron Philippe, their problem is, the, you know, the power, uh, come on, you Spending power. spending power. Their problem is the spending power. So uh, I considered at one point asking the editors in chief to sort of republish the same, um, the same headlines a year after. Uh, it still is a problem, and obviously it's a problem that's been uh, made extremely popular by the Gilets Jaunes. And, well, when it comes to public affairs, we share uh, with Sylvie, with Pascal, uh, we heavily work in several uh, public affairs uh, domains that are very important to us. We work very intensively on the copyright <coughs> directive, I think, uh, that was described and mentioned um, in many uh, places here. Uh, it's a democratic challenge for us. We were able to have uh, the approval, and I know that some, some of you might disagree with this directive. Some uh, it, it brought uh, a lot of uh, discussions forward and, and sometimes uh, uh, baroque alliances between uh, very large corporations and very libertarian uh, small groups. But anyhow, uh, Europe has adopted this directive. It will be transposed into the national uh, legislations in the coming weeks and months. And it still is a step forward when it comes to defending uh, copyright and, and uh, uh, authors and editors uh, in Europe. Um, with the platforms, we have a lot of uh, cooperations, co-petitions, as they, they say sometimes. Uh, my motto is really no hostility, no submission. We try to find the right uh, balance between the two approaches. We have a lot of um, respect uh, for those young companies that have thrived and become huge over the last years. Uh, but we also feel that sometimes we need to defend our positions. And so we learn more and more to work together and to take the best uh, out of each other, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to look at this in a very positive way for the future. And the last word is on the distribution of newspapers. I mentioned the fact that the um, paper print uh, circulation was decreasing rapidly. So uh, we work a lot on the reform of a system that in France at least was uh, founded in 1947. And as you can imagine, a couple of things happened since and uh, a, couple of, um, a couple of large things actually happened uh, since that date. And we need to reinvent the way newspapers are distributed, uh, respecting the idea of uh, being able to, to bring newspapers of all kinds to everybody in the country, but at the same time in a more uh, economic and, and a sustainable way. So I think that's it for the introduction on, on my group. So, um, Pascal Rufnac, uh, who has a, a different uh, model and a different group, media group, is going to uh, talk to you Good morning. briefly. First of all, uh, sorry for my strong French accent. I try to change, but I, I never succeed, so <laughs> <laughs> it's like it. So, two, two facts could describe Bayard. The first is uh, our will to create contents for magazines, newspaper, digital books, and even now for events that we organize some of them with uh, Florence, and the strong desire to make uh, links with communities. We were founded in uh, 1870 with the daily newspaper La Croix, and we are particularly present in three sectors, children and young adults, senior, and uh, our daily newspaper La Croix with a Catholic uh, inspiration. Today La Croix has 90,000 subscribers, uh, 90,000 subscribers, almost stable for the last uh, 20 years. When we launched Pomme d'Api mm. in 1966, which led to the creation of about 120 children's magazines all around the world, and 
with 1.2 million subscribers in France, the child was not really considered as a person in France and all over the world. Few people were interested in the child intellectual and emotional life, uh, relation and inner being. And Bayer wanted to explore and reveal all those dimensions by offering children from the age of two a regular rendezvous with all the facets of creation, fiction, non-fiction, stories from all around the world, illustration, photo, graphic novels, to let them grow their inner universe and create their representations of the outside world. With confidence and in connection with other readers through magazine that transpose all the tangible qualities of publishing to the press. Quality, quality of paper, good, beautiful covers, color, typography. And from the beginning, the creation of this magazine was obviously based on the journalist work, but also on the production of creators from other disciplines, writing, painting, photography, and today, video, animation, music. And what children discover in our press, the very young or teens, is a regular rendezvous and a bond with their contemporaries. The love of words and pictures built the desire of information they will later discover. Today, the need for education is worldwide. It's an essential stake in the construction of democracy. We work with American and Chinese publishers to develop similar approach with press, publishing, or digital platform. Our mission is to be present where our public is present. We love paper, which far from being a thing from the past, possesses incredible qualities in terms of maintaining attention. Digital technology presents other qualities for children, but there is a huge need of education for using digital. As for reading, parents, educators needs to be strongly involved in the process of using digital. If we want involved citizens, free citizens, it's necessary to develop education for media everywhere. We launched with the French TV, a platform from, for primary school, which offers through text, video, some basic approach of what is journalism, information, facts. We push them to build their own newspaper, on paper or online, and they can be connected with other schools. Today, 1,000 French-speaking schools are connected to each other, and the name of the platform is One Day, One Fact. In June 1968, we launched the magazine Notre Temps for senior people. Life expectancy at this time, after retirement, was five years. Today, it's 27. And as for children, at this time, society didn't focus on senior. This time of life was on periphery. For 50 years, our work has been helping seniors to build a community who not only have rights, but it's with also a vital force that continues to build the world. Finance, time, availability, transmission, all over the world, seniors give a lot to the global community. Notre Temps, with its readers, as always, and will always make its contribution to build a world where their place is an important one. And I think there is something with this community, children, and senior, like something perhaps could help for Gilets Jaunes also. <laughs> Our daily newspaper, La Croix, has witnessed the metamorphosis of Christianity in Europe, but it has always remained independent from institution, and I think it's the reason why we are still at 90,000 subscribers today. We have some special field of uh, expertise, like ethics, education, solidarity, something like uh, journalism of solution or Constructive journalist, we say today. And as all the daily newspapers, as Les Echos, as uh, Le Parisien, we face the same difficulty of digital transition. Today, among the 90,000 subscribers, 25,000 are digital subscribers, and among these 25,000, half of them subscribe to digital and a weekly uh, edition. And I think it's interesting because pure digital the loyalty of pure digital subscribers is only 50%, so it's always a, a huge task to maintain our subscriber. But people who subscribe to paper, weekly paper, plus digital, they go up to 70% of loyalty. So I think there is something interesting in the model <coughs> to connect paper and digital for the future of our press. Merci. Merci. Um, I didn't introduce myself, so I'm going to do it now. <laughs> so I'm Florence Martin Kessler, and I do. Uh, I'm the CEO of my very small company called Live Magazine, 
and we do live journalism in theaters around Europe. And we collaborate with publishers. And it's great theater. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Sylvie, yeah. can you speak? Tell us a yes, few words about. Yes. So, I, I don't have slides. Um, I'm I'm more focused on editorial, so I will go over quickly. Um, on the business um, model of Le Monde. Uh, Le Monde uh, uh, turned 75 later this year. Uh, it was saved from bankruptcy, I, I may say. In 2009, uh, we had a strange, peculiar uh, ownership model until then, which was uh, that the journalists were um, majority shareholders and as Many of you know, I think journalists are not the best managers around, <laughs> especially when it comes to money. So um, in 2010, we were bought by three um, rich men who got together to, to buy 60% of our shares and uh, invested uh, quite a lot of money in the newspaper, which, which uh, I think basically saved us. Um, uh, so those three were um, one, um, Xavier Niel, who is a telecom tycoon, I may say, uh, a banker, um, Mathieu Pigas of uh, Lazare, and uh, Pierre Berger, who was a philanthropist and who uh, passed away last year. And his shares were um, uh, shared between, that was organized before he passed away, uh, between the two other shareholders. Uh, there's a new development more recent that we may talk about later. Um, so the business, m when, when they um, came into Le Monde, uh, they, this money was mostly invested into turning around the business model uh, into a digitally based uh, business model and I think it's been quite successful. Uh, it was very... Um, they aggressively invested in, in the digital operation. So we have, uh, from the beginning, we've had a very strong paywall, um, which is not meter, it's a different paywall. It's quite strict, but it's bringing now quite a lot of revenues. Um, uh, today, 53% uh, of our paying audience comes from digital subscriptions. So we've really uh, improved quite a lot our um, our number of digital subscriptions. And parallelly, we've been investing on innovations. We had a Snapchat uh, Discover application, I think already two years ago, which is working quite well. We have uh, a video on YouTube. Uh, we have uh, also recently developed a WhatsApp application for Le Monde Afrique, which is our uh, editorial push on for African audience, French speaking African audiences. Um, so I think this is, you know, it's, a, it's an uphill battle, as you probably all of you know, uh, or are experiencing those who are in the newspaper business, and as my colleagues here know. Uh, but I think th there's, there's a way. Uh, I mean, I, I think we are, we are really uh, now uh, finding the, the way out of, of, of the nightmare, if I may say, because uh, several years ago it really was a nightmare. Um, and we are also, I think as you do, uh, trying to diversify the revenues, you know, conferences, events, and all this. Um, which, you know, uh, is new business for journalists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're getting used to it. Um, so coming, and coming to the Gilets Jaunes, so this is another kind of challenge that we've been uh, confronted with recently. Uh, this crisis erupted in the background of, uh, I think, the breakdown of our political system, and this is also something which may sound familiar to some of um, EU European colleagues and also um, American colleagues. So um, it was, I think, we, most of us were caught by surprise by this uh, eruption and huge disruption of our political panorama and social panorama. Uh, for journalists and for the media, it was a wake-up call because <laughs> first it was a, a, a physical wake-up call, if I may say, because the rejection was very strong at the beginning of this crisis. The reporters who went to the roundabouts where those uh, yellow vest uh, protesters were meeting were 
squarely rejected at the, be at the beginning. They just didn't want to talk to us. Uh, they said they didn't trust us. Now, in demonstrations, a lot of journalists were physically, I mean, a lot, quite a number of journalists. I mean, you saw that on TV, and sometimes it's misleading, but there's, there's really a, at least a, more than a dozen number of, uh, more than a dozen journalists who were physically attacked. And for the first time in France, we had TV cameramen and crews having to go to cover demonstrations with bodyguards. Um, so that's, that. there was a level of rejection which was um, um, really, really shocking to us, I think. Uh, also, you saw the scenes of newsstands being set on fire, uh, you know, which uh, uh, you <laughs> it, it is really uh, uh, also very shocking to, to newspaper people. Um, and the other interesting aspect of this crisis was that the Gilets jaunes bypassed the mainstream media um, in the way they communicated amongst themselves. Obviously, it was all through social media, particularly Facebook, and they organized themselves and they mobilized through Facebook, through groups of uh, ang anger groups. Um, so that was also something we realized <laughs> you know, was a, a kind of parallel universe. Of course, we, we were used to, to um, information being circulated on social media, but that was really a different uh, stage, I think. And it, it, what is interesting is that at the same time uh, as they were uh, communicating through Facebook, they were also expressing frustration and, and anger of being excluded from the mainstream media. So they rejected us, but at the same time, they were telling us we are invisible, and that was mostly uh, directed towards TV, um, uh, TV uh, channels. You know, we don't show up on your screens. And suddenly they showed up on our screens and not in the best way, I must say, because you know there was a kind of panic from TV channels to to in, to to get to get uh, gilets jaunes as guests. So you know the first person who would wear a gilet jaune would be invited, <laughs> and so that was not, I think, not the best uh, way of giving them a voice. But you know there was a, a bit of a chaos at the beginning of this crisis. Um, uh, I think also what was shocking to us was part of this wake-up call was the level of support from the uh, ordinary, from the voters and from uh, the, the public. Uh, there was um, a poll which was actually published in La Croix. Uh, I just had one figure about the, you know, people were asked whether they, what did they think about the physical attacks against journalists? Mm -hmm. And 20, 23% of the people thought that these attacks were justified. And 39% said they were not really justified. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, this is what this, this is the landscape we are faced with. Um, I must say, it's, there's a bit of a reminder of uh, another crisis we went through, but it was much shorter and much more focused, if I may say. In 2005, that was the crisis of the banlieue, where we also, our reporters experienced difficulties in covering uh, the actual actions. Some of them were really um, felt that they couldn't go to those, um, uh, to those banlieues unless they had fixers or, you know, so it was the first time as well that I heard that you needed a fixer in France um, to go somewhere. And now what makes it, I think, makes this uh, whole situation more difficult is that we are also um, um, working in a background of increased hostility towards the media, not only from uh, demonstrators or people who are uh, rebelling against the system, but from politicians, of course. Um, you know, it hasn't l reached the level of Donald Trump yet, but we do hear from politicians um, very strong statements, uh, you know, doubting about the, tru the, 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 li the reliability of the media. Um, and, you know, we are barred from sometimes, even football teams now bar reporters uh, 
uh, that they don't like or they, they disapprove their coverage. I mean, this, this has really reached a, a level which is, I think, unprecedented at, at, uh, um, in general. Uh, I may stop here, maybe. No? No? <laughs> <laughs> no, and I was listening to the previous panel, and I must say, Jay Rosen said uh, it was very interesting. He touched on many of, uh, of the same issues as we are discussing now. And, and Jay Rosen said about U.S. journalism, he said, uh, journalists are in the fight of their lives, not with Donald Trump, but with whole sections of the country. And that, I must say, really sounded familiar to me. Um, thank you very much, Sylvie. I just have pulled out a few, um, a few, a few pictures and facts and figures from uh, this barometer that is uh, commissioned mm -hmm. every year for 30 years by uh, Lacroix. I don't know if you can read, I'm going to translate. Uh, the question asked is um, percentage of people thinking thi according to radio, different media, radio, print, television, and the internet. Uh, do you think things uh, have happened really or almost really as the newspaper, the radio, the television, the internet tells them? So you see last year a phenomenal drop in... Uh, in, in credibility and trust. Uh, the internet uh, doesn't drop as much. Um, so that's an interesting figure. The, uh, the overall trust in the media, I think, is 25%. Is at a 30, 30 years low. It has never been as low. Um, this, uh, there is also many interesting things. Uh, I wanted also to show you um, the screen capture. I forgot to mention that uh, Pierre uh, has been uh, the CEO of Agence France Presse, which is the, you know, the, the, the machine of truth, uh, which is state-owned or semi-state-owned. Uh, so the Gilets Jaunes, no, oh, it's <laughs> fake news. <laughs> so which is a... Uh, um, a Actually, it's interesting. It's not owned. Uh, it doesn't have equity, which belongs to anyone. So, but, but it is uh, par partially, partly funded by uh, governmental funds uh, that uh, correspond to you know, public uh, policies, which is developing French language around the world, having a French uh, coverage of, of uh, the news. So it's a wire, wire agency that makes the news with a very rigorous fact-checking of the highest standard, mm -hmm. obviously. And so um, they protested, uh, a thousand people. Um, so we uh, journalists are thought as a um, mem uh, member of the elite. There is this um, expression, les chiens de garde, the watchdog, we're the watchdog to the system. And I think that only 25% of the people uh, think that uh, journalists are independent from institution and money. Here it is, I got it, yeah. look at that. So uh, the question on the, um, do you think journalists are independent? Meaning they resist to the pressure of the political parties and power. So only 24% think they are independent from political power. And then on the other side is to the pressures of money. So only 24%, same number, think they are independent. It's a minus 3% drop in one year, which is pretty phenomenal. I also, so independence of the ownership of media has been a very clear uh, motto of the Gilets Jaunes. Uh, billionaires own the media. It's not by chance. There is a hidden agenda. And so that has been very recurrent, uh, I think, and you are well placed. Just one thing, so the uh, two other facts I wanted to tell you. Russia Today France um, has been the favorite media of the Gilets Jaunes. I, I mm -hmm. Russia Today is a Kremlin-owned um, soft power tool, that, which is an um, internet-only uh, media. They, have, they say, so this, uh, that's what they say, that they have, um, their, their audience has been multiplied by four, uh, since the beginning of the Gilets Jaunes crisis. People like it, and I'm quoting uh, some... some uh, they like it because they do these massive lives on Facebook, up to 10 hours sometime, and there is it's just, uh, you know, it's just like a surveillance camera. There is no editorial 
but they pretend there is not, but obviously there is. But so th this thing of just being, of projecting this uh, protest has been very successful, and um, there is no censorship because nothing is cut. So this is objective. No, nothing is hidden by the journalists. And last one, so the Gilets Jaunes have starting their own media. One is called VQ. Um, and I just captured their homepage on, on Facebook. Uh, they have put on their banner this, uh, this, um, this graphic that has been um, produced by Mediapart, I think, originally, which says who owns what in the French media. Voila, for now, so maybe you want to add something, Pierre? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot to comment, not only on this last thing, but I, I'd really wanted to share a couple of thoughts that you know, we were able to, to gather uh, analysis, gathering from the, you know, the two sides of the coverage that we do, uh, Les Echos, as I mentioned, Le Parisien, uh, and also all the live events that, that, you, that you mentioned. First of all, maybe if you go back to the, uh, to the origins of the crisis, first, I think all of you know what a yellow vest is. And basically, putting on this vest that you are required to have in your cars in France uh, when it comes to a circulation accident or something, it, it's a sign of distress. You know, you put on this vest when you're in distress. You have a flat tire, you have a problem with your car. So it, it's, it, it means something. And also, it means and it shows a certain uh, mastering of the uh, producing of, of signs. You know, those people have not uh, chosen the yellow vest completely. Uh, you know, errantly on, on by, by luck. So it, it shows distress, and there is distress. You know, you, you always have to, to start talking about this situation by saying that in a lot of French territories, in a lot of French areas, people have little money to live with. It's difficult to, to, to travel. It's difficult to access to the world. So it, there is distress here. That's the first thing. The, the two things also that, that we really um, understand are that two pillars uh, of uh, everything that was conceived and built uh, in the last uh, 30, 50, or even 1,000 years, two pillars are a bit shattered or a bit uh, uh, attacked. The first one is the uh, quiet, uh, quiet victory of uh, progress for everyone. This has been... Uh, and even more after 1991, when, when the, you know, the two blocks became a global world to some extent, Fukuyama wrote about the end of history. People started thinking, okay, it's going to be a quiet uh, life uh, of progress and capitalism producing good results for everyone. We still believe that capitalism, I, still, I mean, at least I do, is the best system to live with, absolutely. But uh, a lot of people gradually understood in the French society, for instance, that it was not going to be always better. And a lot of them understood that it was not um, going to be, be better for their children than for them. And, and this idea that it was better before and that it's going to be not as good after is a relatively new idea in, in our society and it has been very, um, very uh, impressive and very uh, strong for people. The second pillar that I think is, is very shattered is the idea in itself of representation parliamentary representation, but overall representation. Parliamentary because uh, the people that, that gather around um, you know, the crossroads and on the roads and, and um, the cities in France, they still don't want to be represented. As soon as one of them appears to be a leader or decides to create a list to run for the elections, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people around him tell him, you're not a representative, we, c we cannot be represented. Actually, a lot of them have the idea that their sufferings are impossible to represent. They're all individuals, and they don't want to be, um, to be represented by anyone. There is a suspicion against uh, representativity. There is a distrust. And it also, and Sylvie mentioned it very clearly, it also goes to the representation given of themselves by the press. That's another criticism of representation. Um, no one uh, says that it's a fair account. Even the, you know, one of the largest information um, uh, channels in France that has given uh, like a full audience, you know, putting a camera in front of the people, telling them, tell what you have to tell. Even this channel has been accused of you know, misleading and misrepresenting them. And we could, and Sylvie much more than I, could make a lot of comments on the way they, they filtered or did not filter anything. So they give a full uh, picture, but without being accredited for a, a full and, and clear representation. Um, what appeared to us also was the fact that uh, a lot of people 
would like to, uh, to vote all the time, but not to elect. And that's a very, very strong uh, difference also. They would like to be asked to give their opinion in referendums, for instance, or votations, as they say in Switzerland, but not elect. It's a bit, uh, I think, comparable to the way you like and dislike on the social networks. Uh, you give your opinion, but uh, you are not represented. Another thing which appeared to us also is the fact that a lot of people want to be in contact with people who think exactly like they do. And this, this idea of a sort of safe space online that you find, because you find people that you like, you don't know them, but they, they think like you do, so you think they're very interesting people, and they're very good people, because they're just like you, basically, in terms of opinion. This is, for me, the opposite uh, direction of democracy. You cannot always speak only and live only with the people who speak, you know, who think exactly like you do. So this is something that, that appeared to all of us as a, a, you know, a gap created between the way we operate, the way we try to represent reality, and, and what those people were saying. Another thing, uh, maybe, and the last thing that we would like to add on this one is that what is the, the challenge for us now? I think it's a lot of closer journalism, a lot of um, you know, regional, local news, uh, which for national newspapers is not that easy to do. So long reads, Le Monde has done incredibly uh, good uh, long reads and long papers about you know, the reality and, and covering very, very close to the people. We try to do that uh, with the Parisien, obviously, a lot. For Les Echos, it's a bit more difficult. So closer, and also another thing, we discussed it in, in with the two uh, editorial directors of the largest newspapers of my group, and I asked them to be part of the debate, you know, not only like give accounts of what happens, but also make opinions come to us, <coughs> filter them, a curator, uh, like being curators of the reality, you know, like giving uh, an idea of what people say, how they uh, express themselves, and so be part of the debate in order to be part of the solution and not just be part of the, cr the criticism. Pascal, you wanted to add something? A few words, perhaps, and I completely do agree with uh, Sylvie and... Uh, and Pierre, uh, it's true that uh, it's the reason why I spoke about children and senior people. It's true that all, all it's very deep, there are some deep reasons, but for sure, during the last year, there was no, not so many representation in the media of these people, and probably they feel themselves on the periphery of, of the society. Mm. And um, it's true that from the beginning, the President Macron which wants to make the economy stronger, insist a lot about startup, company, active people. And one of the consequences, it's also that for people who are not just in the middle of this, uh, of, this uh, of the life, of the, of the active life, they feel themselves uh, on the side. And at the end, it's, a, it's not necessarily a problem of rational question like uh, uh, the difference of level of life between today and five years ago, because when you look on the figure, in fact, some figures are better today than five years ago. But it's about the feeling and the way you think you, are, you, you have a role in the future of the society. And I think this is very important. And the other question coming from this one is, is it still possible to have a large mass, mass media which represents all the class, all the social class of the society? And I'm very impressed, for example, with Le Parisien because Le Parisien is a popular newspaper and it still represents uh, all the social class of the, of the population. But it's not true for, for most of the, of, the, of the media which are for, for educated people. And in the, in the barometer, you can see there is a huge difference between young people, less educated people, and well-educated people. There is no problem for well-educated people in France. The problem is for people who have less education. And the, the last thing, I think we are publisher, mm -hmm. but we are also mediator. And probably one of our role is to publish, to, to, to explain the fact, to describe the fact, but it's also to organize the debates. And it's what we did, for example, with, in Bayard, in the town Montrouge, in the suburb of Paris. We organize all the four debates with a uh, with, uh, with city which asked us to do it. And it was absolutely wonderful to do it. And we, we give the return of these debates in, into the daily newspaper. Great. Um, 
Sylvie, do you think the, um, in your newspaper, who is the, the newspaper of the establishment? Um, do you, what, what lesson do you, mm -hmm. could you take? Did you, do you think you did a good, you were very criticized, do you think you did a good job at covering? What could you have done better? Why doesn't it, you know, yeah, tell us? Um, Yes, of course, Le Monde is, is, is uh, an establishment newspaper, and, but I think you may say also Le Figaro and Les Echo are also <laughs> <laughs> establishment newspapers, but it's true that Le Monde is maybe seen yeah, as the newspaper, the, the newspaper of, of the intellectual uh, elites, and, and this is very much, I mean, this crisis is a reflection of a broader crisis, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a breakdown of our political systems, of our social systems, of the representativity yeah. systems. I mean, this you all know, we've, we've seen this in, in the US, we're seeing this in, in, in the UK, we're seeing this in Italy, I mean, in many European countries. So, um, you know, it's a French version of this, of this, uh, yeah. uh, of this crisis. And of course, France is all, all, always a little bit more violent <laughs> or you know so that's the french way of express of uh, uh, expressing this these problems and it's of course very much a revolt against the elites so we are part of this elite uh, how have we been handling this we i must say we at the beginning i said we were caught by surprise i would say as a society we were caught by surprise by the gilets jaunes movement but in in le monde actually thanks to uh, one particular <laughs> reporter, Aline Leclerc, and, and then she was joined by a lot of others because we, we dedicated, of course, a lot of space and, and, and coverage uh, to this crisis. But Aline uh, felt very early on that she, she was following this, uh, this group of people and, and she felt very early on that it was going to become something meaningful and important. And so we really dedicated a, a, a lot of coverage, uh, we've gone, you know, we've uh, described their daily life, we've gone, for instance, we did one story which was very interesting that, and, uh, and was very much discussed. Uh, one reporter um, agreed with a young couple of Gilets Jaunes that she met on, on, on a roundabout, uh, Alain and Jessica, <laughs> and they agreed to look at their expenses, their monthly expenses, their monthly income. The title of the story was La Vie à l'Euro Près, the life yeah. to, the, to the euro. Yeah. So and so yeah, it was it a was very fascinating article. Uh, right, it was really about how much they earned. They were a young couple with four children and um, how much they got in social <laughs> allowances, which was also quite revealing because they almost doubled their uh, income with social allowances. And yet they felt that the society failed them, the government failed them, that they were abandoned, even though, you know, the they were The interesting thing about this article, mm -hmm. it was the most criticized with the so most trolling. Yeah. What, why are they uh, buying a SIM card? It's uh, not only, uh, not it only was very, very, very Not only trolling, I mean, our readers, Le Monde's readers, reacted very negatively to this story because they thought these poor people, they don't know how to manage their budget. And uh, so that was, so we did a second story about uh, the reactions of the, of the readers and, you know, because it somehow uh, explained or illustrated the gap between those two categories of the population. So, uh, you know, I think we've gone quite um, far in covering this crisis. Now, the long-term challenge is how do we go on and, and you know, we, of course, the movement is not over. Actually, this morning I was listening to French radio news and, and they are meeting some Gilets Jaunes because we say les Gilets Jaunes, but who are les Gilets Jaunes, of course? We, you know, there are all kinds of Gilets Jaunes. You say the media of the Gilets Jaunes, Vécu, I don't know who are these guys who they are, are doing this Vécu. Not uh, journalists. Well, you know, uh, we have this guy who, interv who is, <laughs> who is, um, uh, going around in Paris and uh, with a camera and a mic and including in <laughs> he came to our building in front of the building and he says I'm a journalist I'm a gilet jaune journalist and he asks all kind of questions and is it the same one okay so but we don't know you know it's it's really the specificity of this movement that they don't want to have uh, delegates or representatives or elected members or you know or, or leaders so we have two 
um, very well-known ones, Eric Drouet and Maxime Nicole, who are uh, very um, uh, talkative and, and, and um, who express themselves a lot on, on Facebook. So there, there we can we follow it. We have five it. minutes yeah. left. Okay. So I'm going to uh, take the questions. <laughs> Can we please say more about Russia yes. here? Because uh, also uh, now I'm doing a research uh, about Russian impact uh, before uh, elections, EU election, um, parliament elections, and uh, I see how many they do in internet. And when you said about Russia today, I was shocked. Wait, what, what, what shocked you? that this is the, their favorite medium. It is true. It is true. But I'm shocked, so I want to <laughs> say, <laughs> I want that you yeah, say it more. Is it uh, is very shocking. We were very, it is, they find it more legitimate because it is intermediated and it is not an, it, it, it's called RT, France, RT, so you, you don't have uh, the word. Uh, they find it a legitimate source more legitimate by the system journalists. There is a huge misconception about what is journalism. You put a camera with people with gilets jaunes, maybe they are people, workers, or, or you know, people <laughs> who, are, and they say, this is the truth, and this is the truth because it's happening, I'm showing it to you. And Russia Today has been very good at doing that, and they are very good on the internet. Um, and Brut is another, uh, media that is uh, that has been exploited his audiences with that so uh, yeah. uh, on Russia also th there was another story which is uh, very telling about what, what happened at one point uh, during the demonstrations there was a rumor of Russian mercenaries that had been invited by the French government to fight against the gilets jaunes <laughs> so you know this this goes really really far you know no one ever saw a Russian mercenary on French ground uh, but it was discussed by people, so I'm sorry about that, I, and I, I don't mean to shock you even more, but a lot of uh, talents are credited to Russia. You know. Hello, I'm Yavuz Baydar, a Paris-based um, editor uh, in exile since the coup d'etat. Um, the, the opacity of, of Gilles Jean uh, as a movement uh, is puzzled us, we reported about it as well. It depend, to read into the movement's identity uh, was a challenge in the early phases uh, as it rose. And it depended on whether you were giving a leftist perspective or liberal perspective or academic perspective. So we were kind of puzzled with this uh, and the hybridity of it. How, how was it, how big a challenge was this for the, for the newsrooms to identify, to x-ray the, the, this, this uh, hybrid movement, uh, uh, was it a challenge that you had, to, you had to change views as the, you discussed within the newsrooms about this or was it really, oh, we know who they are, uh, mm -hmm. etc. So I want to hear your you know, professional perspectives about this. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a big challenge. I mean, it's not opaque. Uh, it's just that they are so, so uh, it's very diverse. There are many of them and as I said, they, are, they don't, uh, have representatives, so uh, you have to pick up who you want to choose, who you want to talk to. So we had numbers of reporters who went to, as I said, on the roundabouts or in demonstrations, and so you just have to uh, find your best judgment and 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 you know select what is uh, most uh, interesting or informative about 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 them. Then you have the population behind, because what was also very interesting about this movement, which has its highest point involved at the beginning, 200,000 demonstrators, now it's only, I don't know, 30,000 or something. But the level of popular support shown by the polls was very impressive. Uh, so what also we tried to cover was where did they come from, what was in the background, who were these populations that we hadn't 
given enough coverage, and I think that was the problem also, uh, that we hadn't, you know, we are all Parisian newspapers. France is a very centralized country, and these elites are all, you know, concentrated in Paris. In and, three um, arrondissements. Yeah, and even <laughs> le, le, le Parisien, I know there's Aujourd'hui en France, but Aujourd'hui en France is a national version of Le Parisien mostly. And so even Le Parisien, which is a popular newspaper, is Le Parisien. So these people who live not in Paris <laughs> and, uh, you know, in rural areas or in the periphery of small towns, because this is how the urban urbanization has been yeah. developing in France, felt really uh, left behind. And this is... I think also where we have to focus Another our coverage. Another question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Daniel Turi, Al Jazeera. Um, one aspect, uh, one kind of demographic aspect that's been talked about of the Gilets Jaunes is um, this difference between the periphery areas of France and the metropole. Um, is there a, um, a factor, you talked about them feeling invisible. Um, is an aspect of this to do with the decline of local news um, do people feel like their areas are not being covered? Yeah. I, I was just going to add this to what Sylvie w w was uh, explaining. Um, another way I think that the newsrooms reacted was, was giving more uh, time and attention to experts. Actually, you find some guys uh, working on geography that have written about the lost territories of France for years. Uh, you find sociologists also. And you know, we do this in the newsrooms, but I think even more in the, in the recent period. And at the same time, it was also a time of contestation of the experts. You know, no one was expert of anything, but, but at least some people gave us clues about the lost territories. What we can add is that it's true that in, in, in a lot of territories, you have less train, you have less uh, public services, you have less, um, you have not such a good internet also, even though the operators do try to bring uh, fiber and everything to all the territories. And, and a lot of those people find themselves uh, knowing about the world, but a bit invisible and not accessing this world. So, so you know, to put it in very general terms, it's a lot of this that has happened. And uh, Sylvie was ma making another uh, remarkable point saying that there were never more than 200 or 300,000, which is a lot of people, but it's not you know, such a huge crowd after all. You, know, you see protests with one million people sometimes. Uh, but uh, they were, a lot of the, the opinion polls showed that people thought they were representing themselves. So they were representing a sort of general uh, distrust and, and uh, distress, uh, but they don't want to have representatives themselves. So again, this goes to this question of who are they speaking for? And, uh, and so that I think one of the answers is giving a lot of uh, time to people to, to go in depth into data, into analysis, and it gives a lot of, uh, I think, um, responsibility to the governments to, to reproduce links and, and connections between everyone around the territories. Because again, you cannot be uh, feeling part of the global world if your problem is the end of the months and not the end of the earth. You know? So no. people hear about general things, but for them it's going to the end of the months, you know, literally. And so this puts a huge gap between the general perspective and the sheer reality of people's lives. And I think this is going to be uh, the gap that we have to fill collectively. Um, we are going to have to uh, stop here. Uh, we would have a lot of things to say about diversity in the newsroom and how to uh, solutions to this. But thank you.